I'm Richard Gerhardt, founder of Gerhardt Law, a full-service intellectual property firm specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt, not an attorney, but I work at Gerhardt Law with helping with the marketing, and I have my own startups. Welcome to Passage to Profit, the road to entrepreneurship, where we talk with small businesses, entrepreneurs, and discuss the intellectual property that helps them flourish. And today we have on our show a really spectacular guest. Um, her name is Marcy Axelrod, and she's an author and a speaker. And her latest book is How We Show Up. And that's all about how we choose to show up. So we'll be talking more with Marcy in a second. And then we have Philip Hum, who is a storyteller. And he has a book, The Story Selling Method. And it goes on from there. But storytelling is so important for your business. So I'm really interested to hear what he but has to you say. You have to tell the right stories, right? And you, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell wrong stories and it won't help. So, And then we have Chad Price and he has Life Grows Green CBD products to make us all feel better. And he's written a book too, Preparing for Battle, about entrepreneurship. So we are really going to have a great we show. try a CBD product one of these days before we do the show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what comes out. <laughs> anyway, it's time for IP in the news before we get to our distinguished guests. And so what is the topic du jour? Well, I found this from businessinsider.com and it was written by Hannah Gedehan. I hope that's how you say her name. Oh. So it's hot girl walk versus hot girl walk. After TikTok, trend starter says a Florida company is infringing on her trademark. So basically she started hot girl walk in Delaware. And then uh, these girls in Miami decided they want to do hot girl walk. So they just stuck Miami on the end of it and decided they could use her branding. And she wasn't too happy about that. But guess what? Hot girl walk. The original owner had a trademark on hot girl walk, right? She did. And she what happened this. after that? Well, so I, first I want to say what hot girl walk is. I mean, I, you know, you're thinking, Oh, Courtney, or uh, Kardashians or, you know, no, hot girl walk is where girls get together and go on four mile walks, hikes, oh, basically. Oh, so, so it's a, it's a, it's a hiking brand. It's, it's not. Yeah. It's, it's like a hiking group brand. Right. So she, so the, the girl that started it and Amelia Lynn started it in Delaware and Monica Villegas and Lucia de Torre started it in Miami and took her brand and Amelia said that she originated it in 2021 and it's fitness training and inspirational messaging. And what really made her upset was that the, uh, the two girls in Miami said they started, they originated it and they didn't be, they stole it from her. So it, they have now, it looks like rebranded because their Instagram page no longer exists. So, I mean, that's if you're an IP person and you think intellectual property is important, it's a great story because um, she was able to use her trademark. The owner of the Hot Girls Walk trademark was able to uh, stop somebody else from, from using the brand. And she didn't have to file a lawsuit, right? She didn't have to take extraordinary measures. And so it's when you have trademarks, sometimes just having the trademark is enough to discourage copycats. Right. Well, she followed the lawsuit, but it didn't go that far because I think they realized they were going to lose. Oh, okay. So, well, no, can you cut that part out then? Yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> this is All right. The way this article is written is a little hard to follow. Anyway. So anyway, so that is our IP in the news. You cannot just take somebody else's branding and slap another word on the end. <laughs> and hope that that gives you freedom to operate. If you want to make sure somebody can't do that to you, a trademark helps a lot. So Kenya, hi, welcome to the show. So what do you think about this hot girl walk trademark situation? Well, it's interesting because you both know that I'm in the world of fitness, right? And there's really not anything new under the sun when it comes to anything really workout or fitness oriented. It's kind of a, a gray area sometimes and like who really created and invented what. But I think she was smart in that she like you said, got her trademark and got the name secured. So at least she has a leg to stand on. Cause I know with certain trademarks um, and IPs, it's hard to kind of get things marked in the fitness space. Um, so at least she had that in her favor. 
Yeah, I think it was a pretty original name for, uh, you know, from a branding perspective, right? Because you're like, Hot Girl Walk, what's that about, right? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> you definitely want to go see I, that. I, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> we want to define what a hot girl is, right? <laughs> so, Marcy, what do you think about this? So, I think the underlying phrasing of hot girl walk is extremely catchy and it's visceral and it's sexy and it's exciting so to a certain extent i don't blame other people for being allured by it however cle clearly um you know taking what was started by someone else and commandeering it as your own uh breaks breaks laws and i think that we all need to be very careful because we all stand on the shoulders of of giants and we are all impacted by what we see and hear at all times so we may not recognize that a seed was planted and we think it's our own right so i can see both 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 sides about why this happened but i'm i'm very glad that it seems to be resolving the way that that you said which is that it's it's trademarked and the original the originator will be able to benefit. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting here too, is that looking at it from maybe the, the boutique's perspective, the infringer's perspective, maybe they saw it on uh, TikTok and they just thought it was fair game and they just thought it was a slogan and they didn't realize that there was a, right. a trademark on it. And they just thought it was sort of out there in the general public. And, right. but if you're going to start a business, you always want to do right. a trademark search first. Yeah, especially if you're going to invest a lot in your branding, your website, you know, they, they may have had hang mm -hmm. tags, they may have had brochures, they may have had packaging all with hot girl walk on it. They made a substantial mm -hmm. investment and, you know, they may have to change all of that. Right. So um, if you're going to start a business, it's good to check out the name before you commit to it. I think that's, that's uh, standard trademark attorney ad advice. So, um, so that's great. So Chad, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I, I think, you know, copycatting is, is the highest form of flattery. So, you know, I think that <laughs> the, hot, the hot girl walk should be, should be glad that they're actually copying it. Um, but, you know, when you think, think about it from just a business or a legal perspective, uh, I'm glad it played out the way it played out. I think there should be circumstances like that or cases like that in the news. And I think that kind of sets the, the rules for everyone else. You, you know, you can't just add Miami and Texas or whatever you want to the end of people's names. Um, you know, like you said, like you suggested, everyone needs to do some type of trademark search. Really just if you if you're starting a brand, I think that's a essential part of, uh, of building one is can you actually get away with, you know, selling this in your area or globally or whatever kind of ju jurisdiction or geographic area you're targeting? Yeah, I, those are comments are well taken. And um you know, if you do that, then you can avoid the problems that um, that the store owners uh, ran across in this case. Uh, Philip, let us know yeah. what do you what are what's your take on all this? Yeah, I'm actually thankful for hearing that little story because me as a small business owner myself, I feel that this let's say trademarks often push out that decision. Right, I'm always like, ah, eventually I'll look after that. And that's not the right approach, right? At one point we see, okay, hey, this is going somewhere. We should just sit down and make it a priority. But I noticed myself that, hey, all of these other projects are just flying in. And then I always push it out. And I think this was just a gentle nudge as well to start looking myself again into all the things that I may be trademarking or where I want to get some copyright on. So thanks a lot for sharing that. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Philip. And I, I do think that you're, you're right. Uh, when you're in a startup mode, you have a lot of competing priorities and you, you also have a limited budget. So you kind of have to decide, you know, what comes first. And mm -hmm. so sometimes the legal piece gets pushed down the road. Uh, but once you start spending real money on your marketing and branding and you're really committed, you really do need to do uh, spend the time and the money to, to do the search on your name. It's it's not that expensive compared to a lot of other investments that you would make. It's certainly less than the cost of a website, substantially less. Mm -hmm. And just to have that peace of mind that you're not going to have to go back and redo things later, I think is important. So anyway. So Kenya did her research on her brand. Right. 
So what are your thoughts? Well, I, it's important, right? And I think, and, and you guys are helping me with the trademark for that. So thank you for all this. Um, Cause I think research is going to be the thing that kind of makes or breaks you, especially in my industry. Um, it's going to be the differentiator. And I think the more data you have and the more information that you can put up there to back up your brand, it just gives more credibility in the marketplace. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And I guess the lesson of the story is that you should trademark or investigate your trademark before you start mm-hmm. your business. And we have a website that can help you with that. If you want to learn more about trademarks, go to learnmoreabouttrademarks.com. And you can set up a consultation with me or in the alternative, you can download some free content about how to, how to get trademarks and their importance and their value. Uh, it's a great information source. It's called the Entrepreneur's Guide to Trademarks. So check it out at le- learnmoreabouttrademarks.com. And now it's time to get to our distinguished guest, uh, Marcy Axelrod. Thank you so much for joining us. Yesterday, you for our for our, our, our audience that are listening to the show, uh, Marcy is wearing a cowboy hat. And so she asked before the show yesterday if she could wear a cowboy hat. And uh, she looks great in the cowboy hat. So thank you for that. And if you want to see more about Marcy, you should go to our YouTube channel and you can see all of the amazing guests that we have on the program today. So Marcy is a keynote speaker and she's a two-time TEDx speaker. Um, She's award-winning author, TV contributor, and management consultant. And her latest book is How We Choose to Show Up. Sounds like uh, it, like it's going to be a fascinating read. So, uh, Marcy, welcome to the show, and tell us uh, how should we choose to show up? Well, Richard and Elizabeth, thank you so much for for having me on your show. You've you've had such fabulous guests, so um, such a, a privilege and an honor to be here. Yeah. So, the m- very quick, really short answer to your question about how should we choose to show up is that we should actually choose. What my research shows starting back in 1999, right, 20 plus years of research is that 80% of us just show up 80% of the time. And when I get into discussions with people about this, I mean, a crowd gathers and everyone says, oh my goodness, exactly. I, I mean, all I've ever done is just show up. And then they kind of look at me and say, well, how should we, how, like, how can we do it d- differently? And Often those discussions can go a long time and I end up with some kind of impromptu focus group. But I, as we get into things, I'm going to very much explain how we as individuals, um, as entrepreneurs, as parents, as members of a society can very quickly um, choose how we show up such that we live happier, healthier and more successful lives. Well, I love what you're doing. You and I had a conversation yesterday. I do want to say that Marcy is a Gearheart Law client. She works with David Postolsky at Gearheart Law. So thank you for that, Marcy. Um, but you, we talked about understanding how showing up works and what it actually means. And I know you've asked a ton of people this question. So really, what does it mean to actually show up? Yeah, so I'm going to answer this by painting a picture for us about what we all do. And I want to be very, very clear. There's no judgment here. There there isn't so much a right and wrong as there is an allocation. How much of what type of showing up is going to be the right fit for us to live the life that we want and to leave the legacy that we want and to make our business as successful as we want it to be, right? And to have the relationship with our customers and our team that, that we want. So effectively what most of us do and what I'm told all the time, this is a direct quote here, I check my look, the weather, the timing, and I head on out, right? So to a certain extent, this is improv life, call it default life, we're just winging it, not quite grasping, right? The success and closeness and meaning that we all seek, right? I I, I just spoke with a neighbor who said, Mercy, like I, if I get, you know, myself and my kids out the door on time and I have half my wits about me at, at 10 a.m., that's a success. <laughs> now, you know, what's so bad about this, right? Right? Because 
the really important meetings and moments and events, we truly show up to those, right? We show up grounded in ourselves. We show up ready for the situation and we show up with an interest in connecting with the people and the activity because there's an import there, right? So that's really, really good. But with the rest of our lives, we kind of chat, do, and decide, right? We kind of live on this X plane of, you know, timing and tasks. We don't go up to the Y and kind of look, look down and say, how am I choosing to show up? The oh, moment we do that, mm -hmm. the, the moment we do that, we actually switch from our left brain, which is this kind of um, kind of simplify and can categorize and it's very efficient and it's mechanistic. We shift into our broader perspective, right. which is in our right hemisphere. And that lets us see how things relate to each other and what the meaning is so, and what's going to be the <clears throat> result, you know, not just the first order, but the second, the third, the, the fourth, we can see across time. So what and is, Marcy, can, what is the, um, what is the role of engagement in showing up? So when I think of, I think somebody who's showing up, I think of them as being really engaged and really focused on what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so somebody once said, Richard, you really showed up in that meeting. I wasn't quite mm -hmm. sure what they meant, but I think they were referring to the points that I made where I was especially passionate, right? And so that was like the, the definition of showing up. How does that fit with your general concept right. of showing up? Right. Perfect, Richard. So I'm going to put it, I'm going to put my show up lens on and I'm going to explain what that person was probably also saying, right? So what my 20 years of research uncovered is that there is a natural model of how human beings are designed to show up, right? And when you know what the natural model is, you're going to say, this is so straightforward. You know, I get it, right? How simple and clear. And what it is and what that person saw is that you were an individual self existing within a situation, but also you are a member of something larger, self, member of situation, member of society. And what that means is that to some extent you had a skill in each one of those three roles. You were grounded in yourself to a certain extent, right? You were ready for the situation and you were co connected or what I call all intelligent in your societal role. You were probably feeling what other people felt. You were probably responding, not just to what they said, but to how they said it and to, and to why it matters to them. And in that, you truly showed up. You were in your three roles. And <laughs> well, I, I, I still remember the day when I heard that comment. And <clears throat> I would say mm -hmm. sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. It almost seems to be, uh, you know, almost random when those moments happen. But it, it, when, it, when it does, it feels really good. And it feels like, as, as you say, I'm being my authentic self. Kenya, what do you think yeah. about showing up? Yeah, well, I kind of want to simplify it a little bit for the audience, right? Like, let's take a look at what it looks like when you just show up. Like, what are some of the characteristics of that? The characteristics of just showing up are what you see around you all the time. We may be with someone, but we are not, not, we are not addressing what they're really saying most of the time. We are disconnected from them. We aren't thinking about the implications of the moment and su such that we can be with, to, and for them. Really, it's just people passing by, right? And that's why that we have an epidemic in this country of loneliness, of anxiety, of stress because people are searching for so much more, right? Ken Kendra, there's a reason that our 19th Surgeon G General, Vivek Murthy wrote one, one book. And the one book wasn't about obesity and it wasn't about di diabetes and it wasn't about education. The one book he wrote, it's called Together, 
right? And the 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 subtitle is something about you know how to how to th how to st um, thrive in our mostly disconnected world. And um, I should also mention um, Elizabeth and Richard, your your guest from I think the seventeenth, who really did a great job on your show and spoke about AI. His name was Manuj. Uh, uh, Garawal, he spoke about exactly this, and he said they are using AI to help people relate more deeply and and to connect with each other. Because he said he said we don't even hear each other. So, Kendra, does that at all relate to some of what you might be experiencing? Well, I'm just trying to figure out like how this is applicable to like the entrepreneurial world, right? Like, what does this look like when you're dealing with a client? Like, what is showing up at your full capacity look like? What is your showing up look like at your full capacity in a board meeting or a presentation or in a pitch, right? Like, I'm just trying to break it down. So when you think about your business, so, so listen, everything shows up, right? A business shows up, a product shows up, a person shows up, a situation shows up, a nation shows up, an exercise routine shows up everything shows up and everything has an individual self-focused role, a situation focused role and a societal focused role that is connected to something beyond what it itself is. So when you think about metrics by which people run their business, customer churn, attrition, cost of sale, the, the more you truly show up within your three roles, the more deeply you relate not just to the people, but to the implications of the situation. So what you find is that customer churn goes down, attrition goes down, cost of sales goes down, marketing costs go, go down, lifetime value of the customer, which by the way, is an extremely self-focused role. Why don't we look about, look, look more toward what is the value of the product to the customer across their lifetime? So it's a it's a lens that turns us from being too much into in our self role to being far more into our socially co connected role, and this is what I call all intelligence. And what it is is recognizing that there's a reciprocity going on between people, and within our products, within the marketplace, there's a reciprocity and a symbiosis with which we were designed to show up and it makes us kinder and more patient and therefore leads people to, to want to be with us. It makes us and our products and services magnetic for others. I think one thing that might help explain it too, Marcy, is that you have studied neuroscience and there is a neuroscience component to this. Could you talk about yes. that a little bit? Yeah, this is absolutely huge, right? Because being very much in our like time and task mode, right? Right, as human doing more than human beings, um, which our society is, you know, tremendously <laughs> stuck in. And this is actually an evolutionary result of the industrial revolution. It goes back hun hundreds of years that we are very much more living in our left brain and our right brain. And it ba basically means that we're far too narrowly focused, right? Right. We need to survive and to, to feed ourselves and to survive, right? And that's what the two hemispheres of our brain are designed for. To feed ourselves, we need to be narrowly focused. What is the agenda of this meeting right now? And we simplify and we take things out of context. And what, what we're designed to do though is, is, to, is to have a much broader lens and, and kind of go up on that Y axis and look down and say, how am I choosing to show up? And then we can see something that's larger shift into our right brain. The right brain is the one that, that notices the language of the body and the tone and the cadence. It's the one that connects, that feels love, that, that recognizes the implicit reality of the situation and this is what leads us to be magnetic for people for ideas for for the the um possibilities that are out there so marcy the reality of the situation is that we need to take a commercial break but we'll be back <laughs> with more passage to profit <laughs> and our exceptional guest marcy axelrod right after this well, welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit, The Road to Entrepreneurship. 
with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, and of course, Kenya, our media maven. And we have been talking with Marcy Axelrod, really interesting stuff about how you choose to show up and what that does for you in the world. And Richard has a couple more questions for Marcy because well, we didn't get I, I, quite I, finished. Now, now that Marcy's here, I'm like obsessed with showing up. So I'm like sitting here wondering, am I showing up okay? You know, but- uh... <laughs> you, have to, you have to be present, I, right? So Marcy, uh, one of the things that, you know, we've been wondering about since Passage to Profit is all about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurism is what do entrepreneurs need to do to show up more successfully? Yes, um, I think this is really, really Im important. And and um, I'm going to explain this by way of, of a kind of very common business leading practice that is recommended. And this was expressed in the 90s when I was in business school, and it's still out, out there, which is that you need to talk about the mission of your business over and over and over. And you need to tell your, your um, em employees over and over and over why the business exists and what it, what it needs to, to do so that people can imbue this. And leaders are told that they just have to harp on this over and over and over, and they can't get sick of it. They just have to do it. And when you step back and you think about it, you start to feel that there's kind of something wrong with, with that. This has been sage advice across decades. And yet what's really going on, like why aren't your employees absorbing this? Why do you need to say the same thing over and over and over? And it's because the employees aren't as connected with the business as they need to be, right? And you start to recognize, you know, the long-term currency of my, of my success, it's not actually money, it's meaning. What most entrepreneurs are trying to do is solve a problem for a lot of people that they had themselves. And that's why the business ex exists. So one of the main metrics and things that I recommend for, for entrepreneurs is to sit down with the three or four most important people in their business. And it can be customers, it can be a, a, a partner. Do it every single week. week. Choose three or four people and sit down with them for, for 10 minutes and say, what's a day like? What are you str struggling with? What is good? What is not? And listen to them and sense who they are as people. And at the end of that, you can mention, you know, I'm so glad that you told me this because this is why the business exists. This is our mission. And this is why we are here. Do you think that that person is ever going to forget what your mission is? Are you going to have to beat it like a, like a drone? No. Those people are going to embed it and they are going to truly show up, not just for you and the business, but now for themselves because their drive is going to be intrinsic so that is one metric right is did you do your you know three or four 10 minute meetings with with your most important people each week the other thing that i think is incredibly Im important is simply to prompt yourself to ask the question how am i choosing to show up because the moment you do that you shift into a different mode there's a continuum of showing up, right? Three simple levels. There's barely there on one side. This is when you're just disengaged. You don't care. You're apathetic, whatever it may be. There's just showing up, right? Which 80% of us do 80% of the time, which as I've mentioned, leaves us, unfortunately, it leaves us lonely and stressed and strained and not quite as successful or happy as, as we ideally want to be. And then there's truly showing up. So just ask yourself, where on the continuum do I want to be? And you can use it as a very simple and objective way to communicate with your team and your family and your so Marcy, friends. Because is, is there an element of vulnerability that comes with showing up? I'm so glad you mentioned that, Richard, because ideally you, you want to recognize, right? We float across that con continuum from barely there through just showing up to, to truly showing up every day, right? We are constantly moving across it based on our level of focus and hunger and, and stress. And it lets us be real because we need to float across it. The, the way to truly show up isn't, isn't to try to not just show up and say, look, I'm going to just show up 50 to 60% of the time every single day. And that is fine. But these two or three things, or these two or three people, or these two or three moments that I know are gonna 
happen. They're going to show up with to inform me at some time. Those are the ones when I'm going to be my grounded self, my ready self, and my interconnected, intelligent self. And that's what I recommend people do. So Kenya, what do you think? Well, you brought up a really good point earlier about people, right, who are good examples of like showing up in life. And I just happened to Google Steve Jobs really quickly. And close friends of Steve Jobs believe th these to be his defining characteristics. So they describe him, described him as charismatic, a risk taker, abrasive, which I can relate to sometimes, a genius, revolutionary, and an innovator. And I wonder to Marcy's point, would you recommend, Marcy, that maybe um, in addition to getting feedback from your employees, do you ever sit down with your team and ask for feedback from them on how you sh how you're showing up to them as a leader? Kendra, thank you for that. I absolutely love that. Yes, yes, and yes. And what the continuum does is it lets us show up to our own team, right? Maybe as the boss, maybe not, right? And say, look, hey guys, at the moment, I'm on the lower level of just showing up and it's the best I've got right now. And all of you have permission to be anywhere you are and to, and to speak your truth here. What the, what, the, what the continuum, the three levels of just showing up does, it gives us permission to be our authentic selves and to accept others for, for who and where they are. So now we can really support each other. Because if I'm really at the lower end of just showing up, it's like, you know, please don't put anything else on, on my plate now. I need a couple of days, right? I've got a kid with a mental health issue, which unfortunately is too, too many of us do. So, you know, I can just do the basics now, but that extra, you know, customer need, please give it, give it to someone else. It lets us say that. It lets us hear that. And in that, we are bonding with each other because we are showing up in a more caring, supportive way. And that's truly showing up. Mm -hmm. well, do you think yeah, I think. I'm sorry. I was just going to say for me and with, with my own personal development, I ask for constructive feedback from people often mm -hmm. about how, because sometimes you're not aware about how you're showing up and you mm -hmm. think you're showing up a certain way and it, it gets like translated differently to people. So I don't know. I think that's a good self-practice to ask people's opinion about how you show up and it may be, you know, brutal truth, but I think it helps you grow. I think so too. I was going to ask you, Marcy, do you think that being prepared is one way to control how you show up. Because I know you and I talked yesterday, you had listened to episodes of the show, you ran things by me, we talked about what would be interesting for the listeners. So I feel like you really wanted to show up and really <sighs> be here for everybody today, which was is just phenomenal. And I, I think that for me, at least, because I'm very analytical and I like to do things a week before they're due and all that other stuff. For me, being really prepared and ready to engage with the person on things I know they they care about is part of showing up. Do you think that's important? Elizabeth, absolutely. So our, one of our three roles is, is, um, is how we come alive within our situations and the skill specifically related to that role is readiness and readiness is profound because once the moment is gone, we don't get another chance to choose how we show up. So it doesn't, it doesn't come back to us as a redo, right? It comes back to us as a what now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, showing up is not a peripheral feature of our operating system, right? Let's just get it straight. It's our defining characteristic. So readiness is, is an extremely profound topic, uh, you know, and I would, I would love to, you know, share with, share more about that because simply understanding what readiness truly is will lead us to relate to our situations differently. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I do think that <clears throat> there, there seems for me personally to be an emotional component to showing up. If I don't have to be concerned about exactly what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do, I, I know those pieces ahead of time then I can focus more on the emotional piece and how mm -hmm. I how I show up to other people. So I do think that preparation is is important. It's certainly 
important if you're in a courtroom or in a hearing with a, with a judge, if you know what you're going to say before you say it, then you can say it in the right way, right? And certainly if um, you're having interaction with clients or customers uh, and you, you know your stuff, then it makes for a different kind of showing up than if you're kind of doing it for the first time. So um, I, I think those are important components. Right, right. And, and I mean, what you just said, right, if readiness is a felt state, right? And it's an, it's an option. It's a priceless option. And it's an expiring asset, right? All at once. Right. And you said it feels different, right? It feels different. So that's, that's absolutely right. It, it, it leads us to be more grounded, feel more secure, and then we can care. Right. And that's, that's, where we have we have tra transitioned to to show up very differently with so much more depth and that makes us um, charismatic and magnetic for others so if you're counseling somebody on showing up what are some of the yep. things that you tell them to do to show up in a more effective way absolutely so the quick tactical things um set reminders um, in your in your um, calendar and on post-it notes to ask yourself, how am I choosing to show up? Make a habit of checking in. How am I choosing to show up right now? Um, or maybe as you as as you look toward tomorrow, what meeting is it in which you truly need to show up? Um, at the end of my TED Talks, I give a little tip that people keep telling me is is effective, where you take out your hand and you write, a three with your finger such that you're embedding level three truly showing up on on your hand what i've been told there was a story uh, a friend of mine um of course is challenged by how his parents show up with two and four him and right before walking in he paused and he found himself drawing a three on his hand and he said marcy i was so much more patient with them i was so much more open so those are those are two quick things that you can do. The main thing, just check in. How am I choosing to show up? That's really uh, that's really great advice. So Marcy, let's revisit the neuroscience. There was something you were telling me about it yesterday that I found very profound. Could you repeat that here, please? Yes, Elizabeth. What what I think it was is is how the way we show up moves not just through the people who are right next to us, but it actually goes three levels deep. It turns out that behavior and emotions, even thoughts are contagious. So the 20 people closest to us are 45% more likely to do what we do. And when I say do, I mean, feel, think, and act. It doesn't stop there. So your, co your colleague now goes home to his or her spouse. That person is now 25% more likely to do what you do. And then, and then it goes further. So your colleague's spouse is daughter is 10% more likely to do what you do. This is uh, the work of Nicholas Christakis. He was at Harvard. Now he's at Yale. Specifically, things that were studied are really definitive, whether or not you vote, whether you stay married, the size of your body in terms of uh, uh, weight, whether you, you choose to drink. So, um, so you can see that it really, how you choose to show up goes three levels deep to people you will never meet and really has a profound impact far more than most of us recognize. And so kind of for your own uh, business career right now, what are, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to uh, to sp spread this information about how you choose to show up? Wow, gee, I mean, the world really opened up to me recently. So um, there is a TV show uh, coming up called Show Up with Marcy, Saturday mornings, 10 a.m. So I'm a contributor on that. I'll be there across six months. Um, I was just told there's a billboard, believe it or not, in Times Square. I mean, nothing I, I necessarily aspired to, because uh, to me, it's the ideas that I want out, out there more than kind of my face. But there's going to be a billboard in Times Square early in September promoting the show, the book, How We Choose to Show Up, uh, which is actually edited by... Um, George Bush's former chief speechwriter and head of communications. So there's a book, How We Choose to Show Up, that is coming out. And I'd, I'd actually be happy to send um, digital copies to, to people because once again, I'm not about selling a book. I'm about getting the ideas out there such that people bring a little bit more intent 
um, and, and choice to how they live their lives. Wow. Well, it sounds like this concept uh, really rings true with a lot of people and it's attracting mm -hmm. a lot of attention. So uh, thank you for bringing that up to us. Uh, we have to take another commercial break. We hope that you'll stick around for the rest of the show and help us with the other uh, interviews coming up. We have some fantastic guests and we'll be back with more Passage to Profit right after this. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our special guest today, Marcy Axelrod, who's been talking about how we choose to show up. And she's got a book coming out soon. Uh, stay tuned for that, as well as a TV show and a billboard in Times Square. So um, a, a lot of great things happening for her. Now it's time for Power Move Kenya. Who is our power movement today? So excited about Power Move because it's a little different today. We normally do not talk about politics on the show, and I won't be talking about politics in this segment, but I wanted to highlight Newark Councilman Dupree Kelly. He was recently on my Power Move podcast. He has a really great story that I feel is a super power move where he started off as part of the infamous hip hop group Lords of the Underground, and that's really where he found his calling in community service. During this time in the music industry, he was using his platform to create a more conscious community through music, and he felt led to make a move into politics and serve as councilman for the city of Newark. So now he's using his influence and platform to improve public policy. And I thought that that was a very interesting power move and play into serving the greater good. So he is our power move for today. And if you want to hear his full story, you can listen to my power move podcast. Wow, we should we'll definitely Excellent. check that out. And uh, it's you you have to have a calling to want to be a council person in New York. So <laughs> congratulations to him. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> to be in politics at all, <laughs> I won't go any further than that. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so well, thank you for that. And now it's time you. for Elizabeth Gerhardt and her segment on what she's been up to. She has lots of projects, and so probably has lots of updates. Yes, I keep adding new things all the time, but I have a startup called Blue Streak Directory. It's a video directory of B2B businesses online, and I've been working on it. I started it in a different form right before COVID and did long form interviews. Now we're going to shorter videos, and I'm pretty excited because when I started it, the software I needed wasn't really there. Now the software is because it's been three years, and so and things change so fast. Well, two and a half years, things change so fast that now I'm, I feel like I'm really making progress with it. So, so yeah, the software capability of Blue Streak, yeah, Elizabeth let me play with it uh, this last weekend. And what it does is help people make videos of their pitches for their businesses. And then the directory organizes uh, these pitches. So if you want to, if you're shopping, say, for a business coach, you can look at a number of different business coaches and then based on what you hear, you can, you know, call them or contact them. And it's, it's a, it's a quick way to screen, um, you know, different service providers and, and, uh, and the software though, that, that teaches somebody how to make a video is just amazing. So. Yes. And to Marcy about to Marcy, it really helps you choose how to show up when you're trying to get clients online. Right in a video, which gives you much more information than just a photo or, you know, some written right work. So yes, I see Marcy unmuted, right? So um, yeah. And then I also have the Jersey Podcasts podcast, which I do with Danielle Woolley, where we talk to cat lovers and dog lovers. We recently had someone on who's allergic to cats. And so we had a little cats versus dogs thing, which is always so much fun. And she has, so anyways we're having a lot of fun with but, that we but since it's a podcast about cats the cat lovers always win the, well, the argument with the dog lovers, ultimately right? i thought my argument was the best but and danielle hadn't even thought of it before but anyways you would have to listen to the podcast to see see what happened but we're having a lot of fun with it. We upload a new episode every tuesday and it's on youtube and it's on all the podcast sites so that is going really well. We have a lot of people that want to come on the podcast and, and they're interesting and, and we have fun with it. So that is what I am up to. But now I have been waiting to hear. So 
I, I before I introduce this next guest, I want to say when we started radio, Kenya told us it's all about storytelling. Radio, you know, especially anything is about storytelling, but radio, especially it's audio. So our next guest, Philip Hum. That's a great story, by the way. <laughs> Philip Hum is here with us. And he is all about the power of storytelling. So he is just such a natural fit for this. And he has a book, The Story Selling Method. And he's helping entrepreneurs take something that would be boring and turn it into a story, which is really what people want to hear. So welcome, Philip. Tell us all about what you're doing and how you do it. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for having me. So yes, I'm a um, business storytelling coach. So what I do is very much help leaders, sellers, and entrepreneurs tell stories in business, mostly to build trust, connect, and stand out in business. And at the end, it's always funny, right, when you come to entrepreneurship, because I've worked by now with tons of entrepreneurs. And usually they are great at these technical components. They're great at building the product, the MVP, all the technical stuff. But when it comes to even the basic, basic things as sharing a story in a compelling way, connecting to a VC, that's where they struggle with. And most people think always that, oh, it's so hard, right, to get into that. But at the end, if you just do some hours there, it's a beautiful return on investment. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do is I help entrepreneurs and leaders uh, tell better stories at work. That's great. So. Uh, can you give us some examples of uh, stories that like turn sort of mundane business products into uh, something that's kind of exciting uh, for the for the consumer or the seller? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, let me let me give it a thought. Mm, let me give it a thought. Which one? I'll give you I'll give you one that um, that that I just read, I think last last week, and I think it's a very powerful one. It's by Nordstrom, which is more of a bigger enterprise, so it's not a small enterprise, but I think it's very powerful because it proves a point. Often, when we as entrepreneurs, we want to communicate our values, so we want to show uh, what is so great about working with us, right? And oftentimes, we just do that, right? We just say, "Ah, we are here, the market leader for X Y Z. We do this and this and that," and that oftentimes is just not very memorable. Now, what, for example, Nord Nordstrom does one of their values is to really put the customer first. And so what they do is they share stories to make that point. So let me share a story that they share there. Um, in 1979, Craig Trounce was working as a store assistant in uh, Fairbank in Alaska in the Nordstrom there. And on one day, he saw something very, very particular. He saw a customer or a man rolling in tires into the store. Oh, a little confused, he walked up to that man and he asked, uh, excuse me, can I help you? And the man said, uh, yeah, I wanted to return these tires. And Craig goes, uh, sir, you know that we're a clothing retailer. We don't have tires. No, no, but that's exactly the place where I bought it in. It turns out that he had bought these exact tires in from the previous tenant of the same building, but years back. And Craig first looked at, thought, stood there and thought like, what am I going to do with that guy, right? But then he decided to do what is what felt right. He called the local tire agency to get an estimate of the, um, of the tires. He then uh, collected the tires and gave a refund. He gave a refund for a product that Nordstrom didn't even have on their sodomant. Isn't that an incredible story? And why am I sharing that? It's just... Anytime when we as entrepreneurs, we want to make these claims or as leaders, we want to make these claims of what is so unique about working with us. Instead of just making that claim, try to find a story that actually backs that up. Otherwise, anyone can make that claim. That's an amazing wow. story. And uh, I think it's it's definitely worth retelling for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's what like long ago when I was doing some writing stuff, showing, not telling, right? So the stories show, instead of saying, I'm the greatest, that's telling, they show how you are the greatest, right? If, if you are. That's it. So, so Kenya, yeah. what do you think? I think that's a really cool story. And it brings you back to this uh, quote, and I say this on the show a lot. So if I'm being redundant, Regina Elizabeth, I apologize um, about testimonials and the power of testimonials and incorporate 
incorporating those into your brand story. There's a quote by Jeffrey Gittimer. When you tell your story yourself or when you talk about yourself, it's bragging. But when other people talk about you and say it about you, it's the truth. So I think that that goes for people and for brands. My question to you is, what are some must-haves in your story or your value proposition when you're crafting and you're putting together what you want people to know about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it comes to the must have, um, as an entrepreneur, you always want to focus on that one specific moment in time. Those one moment where you had that moment of realization. Let's say you stand there, something happens and you're like, oh man, this is, this is messed up. I got to work on that. So you always want to focus and go down in this one moment that really shows why you chose to go for that business. Now, when it comes to general storytelling, there are a few elements that are very key. One is emotions, one is visual moments, and one is surprise. And just to maybe go into the visual moments, because you mentioned that right now uh, with the testimonials, Kenya. Visual moments, an example, if I told you right now a story about a very happy customer, and at the end I say, well, the customer was very happy that uh, I helped him grow his business. That would be without visual moments. But if I say instead, hey, two weeks later, Kenya called me and said, Philip, wow, this was incredible. I, by now, I have grown two times as much as before. Thank you so much. Right? I use the direct words that were used in that specific moment. So it's not bragging. You're just using the direct words. So if you want to make any, especially customer success stories, more visual, use the words that your client used in these crucial moments of the story. Wow. That's a, that's, that, that's a powerful tip, right? Because yeah. it really, instead of paraphrasing it or summarizing mm -hmm. it, you're using the actual facts that mm -hmm. the customer injected. And mm -hmm. I do see how that could be powerful. Well, yeah. And one way to get those, I know this sounds kind of corny. I've been pushing this a lot too, Ken, <laughs> so this is your Google reviews. And that's really important for your website now. But when when we asked for Google reviews from clients, we've just gotten fabulous stuff back, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff we should be turning around and using in our storytelling, right, Philip? Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. Yeah. So Marcy, what do you think? I mean, um, our, it's, it's, it just seems to me that the, this discussion, um, we're sort of, uh, with Philip, we're sort of connecting, showing up and telling stories. They, 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 they seem to be related somehow. What do you mm -hmm. think? Yes, thank you, Richard. Yeah, so the, the whole visceral, emotional connectedness about it, that's what's going on. And in, in my book, I very much do recommend visualization and I recommend things that, that connect us you know, with ourselves and therefore with others. Because Philip, what I'm really wondering, right? The, the limit of someone's ability to connect with others is actually their ability to connect with themselves and truly know that right feel a level of acceptance and comfort and love for themselves so how do, what's your thinking on that <laughs> no that's uh, really interesting that you raised that because i noticed for myself when i started on my mm -hmm. storytelling journey i was mm -hmm. way too much in my head initially constantly i was just telling that story but thinking ah how does that person perceive me right now am i telling it right i was just worried about all the million things that go wrong and by worrying so much what could go wrong, I became much less of a good storyteller because mm -hmm. the best storytellers, they relive the story as much as possible. So yes. as much as you can just get rid of all the clutter, mental clutter that is going on and you're just in the story, you see it in front of your eyes, the better yep. the story will be. Quick question on that, because I, I was doing a video and actually cried when I told my own story in front of hundreds and hundreds of people, because I, I stutter, you don't hear it, but that's why I'm a professional speaker, teaching people to choose how we show up. What do you think about that? Like when you feel it so much and you're in front of people and you, you, you know, there's like that authenticity beyond maybe what, what you would want. Mm -hmm. Got it. I think I read in one of the books, I think from The Moth, they have a rule of thumb where they say, mm -hmm. um, it's fine to tell it if it's a scar. It's not fine to tell if it's a wound. If the wound is still open and any time that you think about that, it makes you cry. Well, then maybe that not may not be the right time to share it. Once it has healed, you still feel emotional about it, but you can reflect upon it more neutrally. Then is the right time to share it. 
which is really valuable. Philo, thank you so much. Yeah, Kenya, what do you think? I, that was really great advice, by the way. It was. I think it's really powerful. I recently had an experience like that. Um, to your point, I had talked about a very personal experience or situation that had happened to me as a kid uh, in a conversation a few weeks before I actually did an interview. And what's interesting is I had the prequel to the experience that made me cry and I it really came out in the first conversation. So by the time I got to the interview part and actually had the conversation out loud, I still wept a little bit, but it was, to your point, it wasn't a wound. It was like kind of a scar. So I feel like it's healing, but that's super advice. Question about, um, you have a good story. You, you have your value proposition in place. Like what is the best craftiest way to kind of wrap it all up into a bow and really deliver it home? Mm -hmm. Do you mean in terms of how to practice it or... I think a little bit of both. And if practice is part of that, but like, I just feel like sometimes people tell a story and it's long and drawn out and there's really not much of a strong close. Like, how do you tell your story and really punch out and like make it memorable? Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm. First, I want to say one thing because I noticed that as well when uh, Marcy was speaking. Uh, so generally one key advice is that the moment that you start just owning and having fun with your own story, then that's really contagious. And then you can even go a little bit longer. It, does, it doesn't matter that much because when people observe that you have so much fun with your own story, they think, hey, this is incredible stuff. This must be so good that, hey, it's a good story by default. So that's just a caveat uh, up front. Um, then second, um, what I do to get to train myself to always follow a certain structure and not to go too long. I, I, for two years, I improvise a story every single day. So I follow a four step story structure. And what I do then is I get a random topic that can be from the previous day or just any random topic. And I improvise a story on the spot. I improvise it following that structure and using the elements that I know by doing that. And that takes me three minutes every day, but I did that for two years. And that way I just train myself to be able to in, improvise a story anytime and anytime be under pretty much two minutes. So there is no risk of really running over there. That's great. What are the four elements? Yeah, the four elements um, is context, challenge, response, and result. So context, just setting some rough context, where and when does it take place? Who's the main character? Challenge, what is that one big obstacle that is in the way? That can be an emotional challenge, difficult decision, personal challenge, anything as long as it's substantial. Uh, three, response. How does the main character respond to that challenge? What are the actions, reactions, decision taken to overcome that challenge? And then fourth, what's the result? Like, how does it turn out at the end? What is the outcome of the story? That in a nutshell. These are the four steps. So context, challenge, response, and result. And you do that in two minutes? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, two you years could, to get no, to that point, no, you but. could teach some podcasters because like I've tried listening to some podcasts and they're supposed to tell you something and like they never seem to get to the point. It's like <laughs> 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 Yeah, happy to. I guess I also come from the opposite end where I was very mindful, very self-conscious at the beginning. Ah, I want to tell that perfect story. So I always ask, I don't want to waste anyone's time. So I think I overdid it there at the beginning to always be below two minutes. Right now, I'm a little bit more flexible on that. But I think it's just worth to train yourself to be able to deliver something quickly. There is a time for longer stories, but usually not in a sales conversation, not with a VC conversation or just one on one. This is more for bigger storytelling. So suppose you're in a sales environment. Do you aim to tell a story for every point that you want to make? Or mm -hmm. is it just one story per context? Sort of how how often do you go in story mode optimally? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So stories are more you inject them strategically. It's not that I will respond to everything with a story. So if I take my customer conversations, I would aim for maybe one or two stories per per session. And that would be maybe one tiny story at the beginning to build a connection, to build rapport. Then maybe one story um, where I show how I've helped another customer. And then maybe in another meeting, more of these value stories that show how I am different. But usually stories are more, they, they are great add-on, but they shouldn't be the main form of communication. 
So the, the stories help build connection and in some cases understanding, right? Because mm -hmm. lots of times complicated things can be easier to understand. If somebody mm -hmm. tells a story about it, right? It's, absolutely. It makes, makes it relatable. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Philip, how do people find you? People can find me I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and YouTube. And you can just say Philip Hum, H-U-M-M. -M. And then also, yeah, check out my book, The Story Selling Method. If you are an entrepreneur or you sell something, then this is exactly what I teach there, how to tell relatable stories in sales. Is your book on Amazon? Yes, it's actually exclusively on Amazon. Okay, great. So go to Amazon, get the book. I think I'm going to do that because I truly am a strong believer in storytelling. So thank you very much. And now, waiting patiently all this time has been Chad Price. <laughs> and Chad has a couple of things going for him right now that he's done. He's written a book, Preparing for Battle, about being an entrepreneur. And he is an entrepreneur with Life Grows Green. So please, Chad, tell us all about what you're doing. Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. So, I mean, right now, I'm kind of closing out one chapter of my entrepreneur journey and, and starting another. Um, you know, Life Grows Green is my, my latest company that I started. Um, it's a company that some people will call it a, a quote unquote CBD company. We like to see ourselves as quite a bit more than that. You know, I look at it as a, a natural product company. You know, we try to create and foster natural lifestyles and create products that people can trust um, for whatever kind of lifestyle they lead. So that may be some of your, let's say, more recreational type products that exist. And that's also um, health and, and wellness products. So, you know, supplements and protein powders and, and different things like that. So we try to just really bring everyone together under the same um, community that we, we, you know, we desire natural solutions for things over uh, pharmaceutical or, or commercialized options. That's great. So, um, so I, you said that you're entering a, a, another phase with the company. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, my most, uh, you know, I'm a somewhat serial entrepreneur. So, you know, I, I've started and um, sold or closed down quite a few businesses over my career. My most notable company, Kettlebell Kings, uh, I sold at the end of November 2021. And that company is, uh, it, it's still undergoing an expansion. You know, it was a three-year acquisition that I started there. So it's still undergoing that expansion efforts into kind of global uh, expansions from what it was here in the, in the States. Um, with the sale of that, you know, that gave me the opportunity to kind of look back and reflect on the things that I've done so far. And, you know, one of those things was kind of culminating that into a book, which is now for sale on Amazon as well as preparing for battle. And it's really to help entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting a, a, this type of journey and trying to get your mindset in the correct place for starting such a journey. Uh, you know, I think calibrating your brain and, and your behaviors and, and the patterns that you kind of do on a day-to-day -day basis for the journey is probably, you know, one of the more controllable things I say that you can take care of before you even start. Um, you know, a lot of people, I, I don't think they understand the difference between employment and ownership. And I try to kind of set the tone and, and get people to understand and think like more of a, a leader versus someone who just, you know, collects a paycheck, if you will. Well, that's, that's, that's great. I'm curious how you chose the word battle in the, in the title. Sure. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think my background in sports, you know, I, I played sports my entire life. I, you know, I played college football at Rice University. So, you know, my, my background and a lot of the experiences I draw from personally are going to come from athletics. When I think of battle, you know, I think a lot of people mentioned it today. You know, I think it's kind of just preparing yourself for whatever may come. Um, you can, you know, you can put yourself in a situation where you're, you know, you're well read on whatever subject that might happen. But I think when you're starting this entrepreneurship journey, the hardest things come from what you don't know. And there's so much that you don't know that you almost have to prepare yourself for anything that might come and kind of preparing you and your team and especially the, the close people in that network, I think is what really determines success early on in the business. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the hardest parts is if you have different people working on different things for you is getting them to talk to each other and understand each other. I, I just yeah. 
conquered a little battle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, I think we can kind of relate to the battle piece for sure. For sure. And it, and it is and it is a battle. And that's and that's that's what I think that's why I chose the word. You know, I, I am kind of that type of personality. You know, I'm I'm more intense than most people would be when it comes to tackling, let's say, the things that I'm going after. But, you know, I do think there is some sense of battle and going into hardship together. You know, entrepreneurship is not easy, especially not if you're trying to, you know, turn something that's nothing into something. That's, you know, that's an uphill battle just from from the start. So having people who enjoy and share in that in that kind of effort with you, I think, is the, the hardest part to get started. So the book is really just trying to give people the ability to create that spark in people and really to find that spark in themselves. Uh, you know, I think it goes a lot to what Philip was saying and how do you tell the story of what you're trying to to cultivate so that other people can not just be invested from, you know, their financial well-being, but also, you know, an emotional and um, personal connection to their work. Right. And it's hard when it's something brand new for entrepreneurs because you have to get buy into something that people maybe haven't done before or used before. And you can't be too far out. You have to be close to what's happening now. And so there's a lot that goes into it. So this sounds like a really good book. Oh, absolutely. So what kinds of thoughts do you share? What kind of advice do you share with your readers in the book about becoming an entrepreneur? I mean, qu quite a few, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't take it lightly. You know, I, t I think entrepreneurship is something that, you know, it leads the world in either positive or ne negative direction. You know, the, the people that choose to kind of go out on their own and start their own businesses are the ones that make significant change in our culture and, and the way we choose to kind of live. So I try to give people that understanding of importance of, you know, is this something that you really want to do? Is this something that you really want other people's families responsible for your decision-making process? Or, you know, you want the well-being um, you know, of your own family to be such at, you know, such at risk when you're, when you're trying to start these types of journeys. I think it's something that people should do, but I think it's something that you should prepare for and, and know ahead of time that that is the expectation. So, you know, I try to kind of raise the bar for people who would want to go into entrepreneurship. Interesting. Interesting. Kenya, what are your, your thoughts? I'm just curious, what made you decide to go into the wellness supplement? realm um it's just a very crowded marketplace and i'm like it seems like a lot of people are doing similar things so i'm just curious like what your insight is there and like what you how are you positioning yourself to do it differently sure um and i mean i'm glad you asked that it's, it's a very competitive space it's, you know it's a, you know they say it's a, it's a thousand supplement companies opening up every day um it, to me it's one of those things that over my journey of entrepreneurship, I never really realized how much my personal beliefs were kind of overlaid into what I was doing. Um, you know, starting Kettlebell Kings in 2012 and, you know, selling it in 2021 or 2000, really end of 2021, 2022 was kind of like um, a PhD thesis almost for me because I got to go back and look and reflect on everything that I had done thus far and what really meant something to me. And one of the gaps that we always had was just, we were always able to traditionally help people from a health and wellness perspective, but not in the sense of the other products in their life, whether that's the lifestyle products that they use, you know, the sheets they sleep on, the, the pots and pans they use um, to the supplements that they use. And my idea is not really to be a supplement company, but really to form a community of, of people who share that kind of like-mindedness of you know, if there's a natural solution to any type of problem I have in life, I should, I should lean towards that and lean away from things that are, are not as, you know, self-sustaining or um, not necessarily from nature. That makes sense. Yeah. What about you, Marcy? What do you think? So two very specific things you said really um, resonate and support, you know, nature's model of how we're designed to show up leaning out toward other people right and kind of focusing on the the community and societal aspect right that's the third role in in which we show up and it's really the one that sustains our our lives right we are designed to exist in community it used to be called a tribe right and the other thing is the extent to which you've you've overlaid your personal beliefs on the the business how grounded we are right in truly identifying what those 
values and be beliefs and principles are, um, that is what it gives us choice in the extent to which we want to bring them in or even recognizing how much we are bringing them in to literally what we do with the moments of our lives. So it really resonates that you mentioned that because you have you have insight into all of your roles, yourself, you know, grounding in yourself and then in um, co connectedness with the with society. And it's how you show up in the situation, which is this book and what you teach. So it's all right there. I love this. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting hearing you speak earlier because I look at everything from a very kind of athletic sports lens because a lot of my experiences come from that. And a lot, uh, you know, I think what sports does is it gives us kind of simulated battles to go through uh, repetitively. You know, you have so many mm -hmm. small battles um, that you've gone through and you see how teams show up or don't show up. You see, you know, what worked, what didn't work. And you looking at it from a more scientific approach is talking about some of the concepts that coaches try to get, you know, players to implement anyway. And it's just, it's kind of nature's way of naturally being successful and how things flow and work together. So I thought that was quite interesting to overlap. I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs at, at Gerhardt Law, you know, filing their patents and their trademarks and also mm -hmm. trying to support them in other ways on their entrepreneurial journey. And sometimes those journeys work out, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. But what I think is important is that the people who are on those journeys are always learning. Uh, they're learning something about themselves. They may learn that they like being an entrepreneur or they may learn that it's not the life that they, they want. Um, but I think entrepreneurship promotes a certain kind of you know, growth and where you really have to take responsibility for what you do and the decisions that you make. And that can be hard sometimes. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. easy to sh choose to show up in a way that's going to make that, you know, make that work. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged that you, you've written this book. Well, what else do you tell prospective entrepreneurs about the entrepreneurial journey? Um, I, you know, I think one of the things I, I talk about quite a bit is the sense of community and then the sense of kind of tracking yourself. You know, I think when you, when you, when you play sports or when you work out, you know, you kind of have a sense of what is right, what is fast, what is slow, what is strong, you know, you, you have this real sense of, of measurable success. And it's really hard when you first start off in business to, to identify all these points, especially for the different people that you have to work with. And, you know, whether that's a social media manager or um, a sales team, what are all these points of success? So really trying to map that out and utilizing today's technology is a much more efficient way to do things than to try to just guess in your head. So setting up testing, testing procedures, basically ways that you can track and measure how well did you do a today's practice versus yesterday's practice versus, you know, two months ago. Um, doing that early on and kind of implementing that as part of your thought process, I think will go a long way when you're an entrepreneur, because when you don't know what you don't know, everything just starts off as a test. And then you're really not even talking about anything, anything of substance until you're looking back on what you did the day before. Well, I, I think the sports analogy is really powerful for this, because if you think about a football game, so I love watching football two things I want to say first Russell Wilson was like I don't know seventh pick or something and the coach and the team he was on when he was on Seahawks made him one of the best quarterbacks ever so that's one thing but the other thing is when you think about what happens when a quarterback throws a ball to a receiver and the quarterback gets the fame and glory but the receiver does too but the, you have the offensive line you have all the other people that are blocking you have you have the whole team working together and that quarterback and that receiver have to depend on everybody else to do their jobs right so that they get the desired outcome. You know, we've learned the hard way, maybe at your heart law that, yeah, you really do have to depend on other people to do their jobs right. And with sports, like you look at the tapes every game, you, like you're constantly looking at how people did their jobs. And I think that's something you have to do when you own a business. Would you agree? A, a thousand percent, you know, one of the things you kind of get numb to when you play sports, especially football, is you don't really harp on the things you did right. You know, you go watch film every single day and you literally just watch all the things you did wrong and you talk about how they could have been better. You should have stepped left instead of right. And 
it, it, you know, it builds a, it builds a callus, if you will, on, you know, your own personal ego. And I think when you're an entrepreneur, you can look at your business in a similar manner. You're not trying to harp on the wrong things of business, but you are trying to get better in a, in a tangible way on a regular basis and getting your employees, getting your vendors to embrace that mindset is the only way to really get value out of them because you have to be better tomorrow than you were today. You have to be better next year, more sales, more customers. And that all comes with, you know, you actually growing as a, as a company. So I try to talk about that quite a bit in the book and how you can kind of foster that culture early on, very similar to the, that you do with the team. You know, you have to kind of have someone who sets that spark and sets the tone for this is the way the culture is going to be here. And, and uh, this, the people will follow you kind of behind that. I could talk about this for a long time, but I, I just really do want to take a look at this book. It's that, I mean, I, I think, I think what's, just very quickly before we end, what's so powerful about this book is most people have played sports. Most people understand sports. So it's an analogy they can relate to when you talk about it in terms of entrepreneurism. I see Kenya unmuted. Did you have one last thing, Kenya? I did. I, you got me talking about sports. So I got excited. I was just going to talk about Tom Brady and how like he was the 199th draft pick. And like now he is like the leadership model when it comes to sports and entrepreneurship. And I always just admire his mental toughness and his tenacity and how he was able to really shift the culture of the Patriots and like just carry a, an entire team right uh, on and on. So we can, we can, I can go on and on, but I, I, yeah. I always thought he was remarkable. Uh, and he, his um, playbook is kind of what I modeled my podcast after. So it's about business, life and sports. So I always just admired his work there in that space. Excellent. Yeah. So Chad, how do people find you? Uh, multiple ways. I'm on, a, I'm on all social channels. So you can find me on, you know, LinkedIn, Chat Price, uh, so other social channels, Real Chat Price. You can also find me on my website. Um, if you wanted to connect with me about the book, you can connect there. Um, consulting opportunities, anything like that. It's all through channels on my website, chatprice.com. Excellent. Well, thank you. This has been an excellent show. But think, we're not done yet. But we're not done yet. Wait, there's more. So... <laughs> We need to take a break. Listeners, you are listening to Passage to Profit, The Road to Entrepreneurship with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest, Marcy Axelrod, Kenya Gibson, our media maven. And we had a couple great presenters too, and we will be right back. Welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit. It has been an amazing show. I've learned so much and enjoyed the company of our guests so much. Now it's time for the question. So Elizabeth has a question for our guests. And we'll see what they say. Okay, Marcy Axelrod, you're on the hot seat first. So the question is, what's your favorite work look or outfit? How do you show up on the outside? Elizabeth, I show up on the outside the very same way I show up on the inside, right? I'm, I was raised by two physicians. I started on Wall Street and then strategy management consulting. So I've got a very conservative uh, realm. So I often wear brown. You can see what my dress looks like. It's it, it's kind of one of those um, old world conservative type of patterns. But then of course the cowboy hat and shiny glasses because we impact the world far more than we think. So I feel like it's really important for each of us to convey some level of you know care, excitement, and engagement with each other. Excellent. So Philip Hum. What's your favorite work look outfit? How do you choose to show up on the outside? Just two weeks ago, I went on this famous retailer and I bought 15 times the same black t-shirt. So, <laughs> oh, Steve Jobs, who we were talking about earlier. He the same thing. Did you go to Nordstrom's by any chance? <laughs> so yeah, uh, people keep telling me to show some colors, but I resist. Um, it just... I feel it makes my life very easy. It makes me look good. And yeah, I just don't want to spend any time thinking about my clothes. Excellent. Yep. As a busy I, entrepreneur, I, the fewer decisions you have to make, the happier the, you are. Yes. So that, I totally get that. <laughs> so Chad Price, what's your favorite work look outfit? How do you choose to show up on the outside? I think I'm I think I'm in alignment with Philip on this one. If, if I could, I would wear the same black shirt every day, but um, you know, I try, I, I usually try to wear something that's, you know, semi-formal, business casual. And then, especially if it's something at work, I try to get, you know, t-shirts or some type of, uh, 
some type of option that's branded with with the company I'm working with. So I'm I'm really big on like having our own quote unquote swag, right? Like I I want us to have polos and t-shirts and hats and different things that people can be proud to wear. So if if it was my choice, everyone that I ever would work with would be wearing the branded, you know, gear that that we're working on. So spoken like a true entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, Kenya Gibson, what's your favorite work look outfit? How do you choose to show up on the outside? Always slightly overdressed, just in case. <laughs> you always look so awesome. You should see her in the studio. Always put together. Yeah, she's to a head night. turner, yeah. I'll tell you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I, you never know who you're going to run into, right? So I'm always big on like good shoes, Right. And and slightly overdressed because you just you never know. And I feel like that's worked for me. Anytime I take an extra step, I usually run into somebody who's worth meeting. So that's been working for me. Well, I remember the first time we met you, I was like, wow, that woman looks so professional. It was at wow. some sort of yeah. networking event. And you were like the like you'd be on the cover of a magazine, a professional <laughs> woman. Or something. I don't always look like right like <laughs> though i mean don't get me wrong like i love my ripped jeans and t-shirts and um my pink birkenstocks on the weekends so. <laughs> so so i think i know the answer to this one but richard well, gerhardt say anything yes what's your favorite look <laughs> outfit what do you like to show well, to the outside course, world? I, I wear suits to work every day and and um uh, I, it, you know I, I i like it because it's it it's it's very professional i think uh, clients, even though they're, you know, the, the dressing for men has changed over the years to the kind of the business casual look. Um, I like wearing a suit because I think it makes me stand out. And of course, whenever I'm on passage to profit, I wear my famous orange tie, right? Which is bright and cheerful and always puts me in a good mood. So uh, those are my dressing habits. And um, well, so now that we've gotten beyond quarantine and I can't wear the sweats anymore, <laughs> I had to, to kind of revamp the way I dress. So I do like to do kind of business casual. I wear a lot of dresses, but I had something really weird happen to me with this one dress. And I'll, sh I'll give a shout out to who got it. I got it from Stitch Fix. I love this dress. It looks really good on me. Every time I wear that dress and go someplace, people physically open doors for me it is the strangest thing i gotta it get could that be dress the mall, it could be the grocery <laughs> store if i'm wearing that dress somebody's gonna open a door for me but anyway so typically yes i i do kind of a business casual look if i'm out of the house well you you have you have so many different choices in your closet it's a, <laughs> well, it's a big closet and it's all <laughs> That's so the, there's a lot of decisions to be made there. <laughs> can I can I point something out about that? Routes. You created okay. your situation, Elizabeth, by how you chose to show up. I did, yes. <laughs> and I'm gonna keep wearing that dress. <laughs> so, so at, at this point, I do want to acknowledge everybody again and their websites. So our amazing guest, Marcy Axelrod, choose to show up.com and you can find her on LinkedIn and she has her book. And she certainly decided to show up today. I thought she did a, a marvelous showing up. So thank you. Yes. And we had Kenya Gibson with her power move segment and she has her power move podcast. So wherever you get your podcast, go listen to Kenya's Power Move podcast because she is an amazing interviewer and she's getting incredible people there. And we had Philip Hum, Power of Storytelling. So here I have is your website, power-of-storytelling.com. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And his last name is spelled H-U-M-M. -M, so you can find him on the internet. But And he told a really memorable story today. And I'm going to be looking for ways to... And interject more spelling, uh, storytelling into my work too. So yeah, and very I think, motivating. I think it was really good. I think to his point though, you can't overdo it. Like you, you got to get the right mix. So I really think he would be a good person to consult with if you can't really figure out how to work it in. So. Absolutely. And then we had Chad Price, ChadPrice.com, and he has LifeGrowsGreen.com, and he has a book, Preparing for Battle, which I think is a very powerful book for entrepreneurs because. 
it takes something we know about sports and relates it to how it is to be an entrepreneur. And so I think it makes it being entrepreneurship a lot more understandable for people. So look for his book. I'm definitely going to check it out. And I think it's good reading for anybody who's listening and who's interested in becoming an entrepreneur. So and or already is an entrepreneur and wants to see what they're doing wrong. <laughs> it's, it's maybe battling a little too much, right? <laughs> and of course, the one and only Richard Gearhart, patent attorney extraordinaire, patents, trademarks, copyrights. If you want a free consultation with him, go to learn more about trademarks.com and uh, you can talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. He'll give you some great advice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a fantastic show today. I enjoyed myself thoroughly. Uh, I want to say thank you to the Passage to Profit team. Uh, look for our podcast tomorrow and you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as our YouTube channel. And while the information provided during this program is believed to be correct. Never take a legal step without first checking with your legal professional. And for all your patent, trademark, and copyright needs, our firm Gearheart Law offers free consultation. So contact us at gearheartlaw.com. That's it for us. And we'll see you next week on our next Passage to Profit.